How did you guys like the conference? Yay! Yeah, thanks for clapping in sign language. I appreciate that. The robot appreciates it, really. Um, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, this is an event that happens every two years, although it hasn't happened in four years. So it's kind of like the English language where it doesn't follow any rules. But what I wanted to do since we're ending a, an hour early is I wanted to wrap it up by giving a talk that I gave at the first cyborg camp. So this talk is 10 years old. And um, hopefully it'll be interesting. And then after the talk, I'm going to shorten it. It'll be maybe 20 minutes. We can do an open discussion. You can ask me anything you like or anybody else anything you like really anything you want, and I will happily talk about it. And then we will wrap up. And show of hands, is anyone interested in writing poetry about tech tomorrow from noon to 4 PM at an undisclosed location? <laughs> OK, great. You two see me after class. And um, that'll be nice. So we're going to make a, a tiny zine, because zines are great. Um, uh, all right, so here's an old talk. Uh, Cyborgs and the Information Society. But I, I updated the year. So we're all cyborgs. If you hold up your phones, which may be out of batteries at this point, um, the point is that every time you interact with a piece of technology, you're a cyborg. A cyborg is an organism to which exogenous components have been added for the purpose of adapting to new ambient spaces. This came from a 1960 paper on space travel. This is not Terminator, this is not Robocop. This is the idea that humans are not supposed to go into specific environments or be like animals, but yet we evolve externally through mental extensions of ourselves, like writing on cave walls and writing in general, or by attaching exogenous components to ourselves so we can go scuba diving one day and climb Mount Everest in the next. We are a weird species, and this is the, the image that goes along with that quote. Extension of a fist, extension of, your, of a tooth. This is the idea behind physical extensions of ourselves. Yet we've had more and more mental extensions of ourselves. And unlike the physical extensions of ourselves, that are fairly standard and stable over the course of two million years, the hammer doesn't really change in its application or its shape. Our mental extensions have changed from cave paintings to spoken word to poetry to giant computing machines that are the size of a gymnasium and have less power than a calculator to something that you sit there in your hand and it performs the function like a scrying pool, allowing you to call up anything from anywhere around the world with a press of a button, a kind of techno-social womb where you can request anything at any time and you get mad if it doesn't show up immediately. Traditional anthropologists are stereotyped as going to other countries, thinking of people as the anthropological other, and then coming back to their first world countries and saying how interesting these people are, how curious their kinships are. People like Margaret Mead getting it incorrect one year and then coming back three years later and then in getting it correct. It didn't really matter if you were correct or not as long as you had the interest of this other world. Today, our world is compressed and collapsed into one thing. We are all cyborgs. We're cyborgs the minute we are using these tools. And a cyborg anthropologist says, what is the norm today? Because it wasn't the norm 15 years ago. Today, we wake up next to our phones. They cry, and we pick them up and soothe them back to sleep. They get hungry, and we plug them into the wall. And yet 15 years ago, we were terrified that when smartphones suddenly started to have cameras, that our privacy would be dead, that we shouldn't allow these into specific places. And other than Japan, which forces a, 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 an actual camera sound when you take a photo, we've learned that when you hold your phone up and you take a photo, that social protocol tells somebody that you're going to take a picture. So it's not really a big deal, because the main thing is that it's not that technology isn't ready for us. It's usually that we're not the ones ready for technology. We have a metabolism rate. And we have to think, how long does it take for us to get used to a new norm? We are hoarding pictures of cats and news articles right now on our phones, which is exactly what somebody does with cats and newspapers in a physical house. <laughs> and it's OK. These are new norms because everybody does it. It's OK to binge watch Netflix. It's OK to be sitting there and waking up next to your phone before looking at your significant other in the morning because it's the new norm. 
Who's heard of the Macy meetings in 1941? Yeah. So, three people. The idea of the Macy meetings was that technologists and anthropologists got together and they said, at some point, tech might not be as expensive, might not be as large. What will that do to the fabric of society in the future? Let's say technology wasn't the size of a gymnasium. What if it was the size of your pocket? What would alter? What would change? There aren't too many transcripts from these meetings, but they were really influential because it was one of the earliest times where social scientists and technologists got together at the same table. Later, cyborg anthropology was launched as a subdiscipline of anthropology at the American Anthropological Association, not the car company that you call when you get stuck on the side of the road, in 1992. And it was really important because it said, let's look at humans and tools in a new way and let's start to look at these non-human allies that live alongside us and how they're changing our culture and how we work into that culture. So if we look at the present day, we have a strange kind of Mary Poppins technology where we have an automatic production of space. This is my favorite kind of ad art campaign. Sometimes you get ad campaigns that work with artists, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. But this one was for Maxter hard drive. And what they did is they said, let's take eight years of digital photos at somebody's hard drive and let's print them all out. And this is what it looks like. And my question is, how many of you are carrying around this giant load that if it were to be deleted, you would have this enormous sense of loss, but you wouldn't remember what you had lost because you hadn't reflected over the photos that you took. Because it's so easy to take a photo that the relative usefulness of each photo diminishes completely. I did a, an art residency at Banff in Canada for a while, the Banff Center, in 2009. And I decided because my, um, my artist partner got detained at the Canadian border and couldn't show up with me, I had to improvise. So I printed out my Facebook wall in 2009. I still have this, the size of an actual wall. Having all of my personal information and interactions with people in this entire gallery. And I thought of it as an old pharaoh wall, the idea that the minutia of a pharaoh could be put in sandstone forever because there's no acid rain. But in a dry climate, you can preserve this for a really long time. And I thought, well, now with Facebook, everybody has the minutia of their lives written on a wall, but it's not in sandstone. Does it really mean anything? And could we go into a digital dark age at any moment where all of this is gone? When you wake up from this era, when you're 80, if you lived that long, what will you remember of now? Will you remember the Reddit binges that you went on, the Netflix series that you watched, your favorite episode of Friends? Will you remember the music you listened to, how you fell in love? What will you remember? And the question is, is any of that just stuck in a hyperlinked memory that isn't necessarily to anything real, but is something that's just archived inside of a machine? How many of you go to your email inboxes and instead of using a plugin like I use in Chrome that says inbox when ready, which just allows me to press the inbox when ready button and hides all my email otherwise, but how many of you just go into your inbox and your attention is immediately hijacked and you're kind of this persistent paleontologist that's searching for a keyword to a memory that you had so that you can get an, an email back to somebody, but you get distracted by the new stuff, the new dust that's settled on the top of your inbox, the top of your digging site. How many of you are stuck in simultaneous time where you decide to do one thing and something else happens on that and something happens on that and 20 iterations later you remember what you were really supposed to be doing? How many of you are trying to have a nice moment in time? The Greeks had two words for time, by the way. One, chronos, the industrial time, and kairos, the time of falling in love, the time of human time, the time of watching rain on the side of a window when the power is out when you're a kid, really being there. How many of you have been punctuated out of those moments by a random haptic buzz of your phone in your pocket that you have to look at because it might be important? And then you just see that it's a Facebook notification that you need to download the newest install of Facebook. This kind of gives me what I like to call a panic architecture. This is, was my inbox after I spoke at TED in 2010. It was horrifying. And I, and I started to talk to people who had relative amounts of fame and they said, well, all the replies come in a few different bundles and here's how to answer all of them. I started using automatic replies, which was not nice. But I did that for a year and it was fine. But the whole idea of this panic architecture is that the amount of time and space it takes to respond to all of this stuff is so much larger than you actually have time to do. 
and every single thing is in the same font size. So it seems the same importance, even though it's not. And you think that every single little thing, like a piece of spam, is just as important as that note that your mom wrote you three years ago, and it's a long paragraph, and you really want to respond, but you only remember that you wanted to respond late at night when you're not at the computer, and when you log in the computer again or on your phone, you get a push notification for something else that doesn't mean anything at all. I have no idea how that interpreted that. <laughs> Freud, yeah, I just skipped it. Freud had this amazing book that I found called Civilization and Its Discontents. He warned of a possible future in which our prosthetics turned against us because they were ill-fitting. And there's something to be said about social class here. Can you not afford the latest upgrade? Does it matter if a company has enough money? Are they required to make the interface work well with you instead of against you? How does a technology work when there isn't great Wi-Fi or isn't great cell signal? If you keep a device for too long now, it does turn against you. The operating system fails. There's some security issue. It just stops working altogether. Or if you have your secondary eye in the shape of a phone and it breaks, what does it mean? Now, instead of being the norm of kind of a superhero, things are broken and you have to borrow somebody else's techno-social ability to get something back. Or the idea that instead of plants that shed leaves that are renewable, we shed our devices, but they don't turn in, into any new devices. When the phone first came out, like early phones, you would go into a phone booth or you would have a room in your home that had a phone. And you could talk with somebody that wasn't there. It was expensive, but you could have this temporary, you could have this private space. And you could sit there and draw on the post-it note or whatever you were doing and tangle your hand up in the crazy long phone cord or whatever you were doing. But then when the mobile phone came out, like the, the original cordless phone, that was the first time a phone could get lost. And now we have this kind of idea of a temporary negotiated private space. There's this, this person on a phone, other people on the phone, and they're kind of temporary negotiating, which I think of is having a peeing section in a swimming pool. Like you're never gonna get a, be able to get rid of it. But the idea is that you had this private space in your home. Now that gets out into the real world. And if you're talking on your phone, in a public space, it's like you're one and a half people and you're carrying that around and so you're like one and a half or two or three people in a seat scrunched next to somebody who's taking up one nice, polite seat. This is one person's solution. Since this is 10 years old, I found the person who made this. I was so excited. I found him, he's an industrial designer, he lives in Los Angeles. I went to his studio, um, he's doing, he does uh, art installation rooms for a living. He makes rooms for artists. He's, he's amazing. And he makes, he's an industrial designer, just makes a bunch of this stuff. This was part of a video series where he made a portable cell phone booth that could pack into a backpack. And he would walk around New York in like 2008. And he would go up to a deli counter and just, oh, sorry, put his phone on and put this thing over him and say, oh, I gotta take a phone call. He also made a thing called a porta party, which was just a porta potty booth, but it had a party in it. And so you could go in and have a party safely really quickly and then like come out and you'd like put people in. The, he did all these like fun stuff. He did another one that I really like called Email Garden, which was kind of a calm tech way of understanding how much email you got. It was a bunch of strands of green plastic substrate that came out of uh, like a motor and the motor would push a little bit more of this green thread up with the amount of emails he got. So if he went on vacation for two weeks, he came back and there's just like this tangled mess of spaghetti wire of the amount of emails that he got. So we could kind of see like what email he got. You know, one was spam and that grew more, just as visualization. This concept of ambient intimacy um, is the idea that, and Sheldon is not here anymore, but he calls it loosely but deeply entangled, is that you might not be around anybody. You might be completely alone. You might be in another country. But there's this idea that you could always connect with somebody. I don't know about the quality of the connection, but if you were to print out all the people in your phone, if you're in a region, it might look like this. It depends on who you are. But there could be so many people that you could connect to, but you're not really there with them. So you kind of have these loose connections. And this, this speaks to Marc Auger's concept of non-places. Marc Auger was a postmodern theorist, French postmodern theorist. And his idea is that a place is something where you have relation, history, and identity. 
So a home, you have relation, you have identity, you have history in a place. But in a non-place, you have none of those things. In a traffic jam, you have no relation to anybody else except for your car. You have no identity except commuter, and you have no history on the road because the road is not something you can stand on. Everything is compressed into two dimensions on the side of your windows of your vehicle. And so a lot of industrial revolution gave us these non-places where we were, as humans, were put on pause. And the way to bring some of that back, to have a place in a non-place, is to have a phone to talk to somebody. So now we're filling our space again with music and other things, but it's kind of like a social light, like it's not a real deep connection, it's just a band-aid. So when we become cyborgs, you know, having a second self before you're even born, and having this production identity outside of yourself, this was my original second self. The Case Organic is an art project that lasted for 10 years, and I'm transitioning to another identity, by the way. I'll, I guess I'll write a report on it. But the idea was to craft a second self outside of myself that would produce my primary identity in a, in a feedback loop. Um, and really, it just becomes this kind of interface for social grooming, where you could present yourself in analog life, and there's, there's an art to that. But a lot of people are presenting themselves in digital life as their exact self. They're getting just as upset as they would in real life. But you can carve it, you can create it, you can see what happens. And for somebody who was isolated in the Midwest and didn't really have a lot of peers when I grew up, I could make a forum and I could try in all these different identities. But now we kind of have a templated self where here's where you put the text. Here's the Facebook profile. What it was originally was like you would speak on the well and you would network and you would have whatever identity and you were the text that you were and you were known for your construction of self through text. Now, it doesn't mean that this cut across all of the social demographics and, and social classes because you still had to have access to a computer. But it did provide us a way to not be constrained, as Donna Haraway would say, by like the flesh. As a cyborg, you could create yourself in any way you wanted to. You wouldn't have to be constrained by gender or social class. You could create that in real time. And I thought, as somebody who grew up not necessarily with all the privileges in the world, that I might be able to do that and have a feedback loop that would produce an identity that was more equal than the one that I grew up in. And these kind of psychological effects that we get accustomed to, it's kind of like a spreadsheet game. You want plus one follower, plus one like, and you forget what are you actually producing? What will be remembered in five or 10 years? Hyper sigils from Grant Morrison is kind of this idea. I, I got really excited about Serial Experiments Lane when I was like 14. Really shy girl with brown mousy hair, uh, didn't really understand the world, yet went online to the Wyerdo and could suddenly produce an identity. So I, I definitely followed this as a template for what I was doing. But along the way kind of realized you can see how old this reference is, that the internet was both a playground that you can enjoy, but also a factory for producing things. You could produce fame, you could produce bullying, you could produce torture, you could produce fake news, as we've now seen. It's just this kind of space of a database game. And the reason why it's so compelling is that the real world, the rewards have slowed down. It's not that you can just buy a house suddenly with the current economy, but you can buy one in Farmville. You can, I mean, really old reference, but you can buy some, that you can do something faster. And if you can do something faster in this virtual world, isn't that more compelling? If you go into Minecraft and the first night in Minecraft, you have to prevent the creepers from killing you, your psychology binds to that game as an animalistic response that harkens back to what it is to be human, to survive. And you're bonded to that game in a way that you haven't been in real life. Why is that? less compelling than, you know, why are these virtual worlds? I mean, Farmville is a virtual reality, an augmented reality. Facebook is a two-dimensional virtual reality. What we forget when we talk about VR and AR and all these overbuilt systems is that it doesn't take much for our imagination to attach to something. That's why Legos are so compelling. They, they invite our imagination to attach to something, and we co-create the thing with our imagination. Of course, that leads to spreadsheet games, social grooming, psychological effects, and the kind of training wills, whoever had, who had Tamagotchis when they were growing up, yeah. This is really funny because I think of this as like a training will, like, please feed the pet so that it survives. 
please feed your friends with text and emojis so they, the friendships survive. Like I'll, I'll go through, I'll set a time and be like, I need to text people with emojis and make sure that I continue to have friends. Because <laughs> if I forget, I won't get access to this pile of Norwegian people. I grew up in an analog backyard and it was really fun. Um, I was growing more physically than I was socially and I brought my tape recorder in the backyard and it was a really fun time. Um, but a lot of people don't have backyards anymore. They're, they're in apartment buildings and an apartment building doesn't have that random free range kid zone anymore. They're constrained and so they go into a kind of digital backyard where you can talk with anybody across any border without a passport. Maybe your best friend is 10 miles away, maybe they go to a different school. And you don't just have the idea of hanging out with like 10 friends after school and then like maybe your mom calls you at night. There's this idea that like it's really dangerous. I go to some other countries and people just run around and they're not into door the explorer, they're just hanging out and coming back. So I'm worried about this kind of disconnect between social and physical development. Um, especially when you have this kind of augmented reality for bullying where, you know, I got bullied all the time as a kid, but when I got home from school, I was safe. It was great. But now, I, like, I can't imagine having to grow up with this, where, like, the bullying will follow me as a virtual cloud forever and ever until my parents switch me schools. My parents did switch me schools because of the bullying. I went to 10 schools. But, you know, there was at least something that could be done. I was very lucky. Um, so how do you kind of merge tech with real life? Instead of having the tech being constrained to sitting there in front of the tech, here's a bunch of fun things that I'm just gonna give you. Cause you know, I had, I had written a talk 10 years ago. I don't really have the structure down yet. You're looking at a history of what I was doing, but Mika Satomi did this cool thing where she made this uh, vest that you could wear and you could play video games on the person's back. And then in doing so, you would be giving them a massage while playing a video game. So, so the idea is that you would connect the labor of, the fun labor of a game, but you wouldn't be wasting that. You'd be able to give somebody a massage. Kelly Dobson said, why do we have, why do machines have to speak our language? Why can't we speak their language? Why do we have to tell them like on and off and have all this voice activated stuff? So she had a blender where you go and a blender would go This other guy, this is a, that's an old picture of me. Um, this, this, uh, this guy in, um, in Germany decided that he would make a system called the North Paw, and the North Paw would just be a haptic buzzer that would buzz in the direction of north. It would be like a belt that you would wear with like 12 buzzers. And it would always buzz in the direction of north. And what this guy in Germany found is that when you wore this, you would develop a sixth sense for wherever you were. And he found that like a month later he would dream and he would have a buzz to where his home was in the dream. <laughs> um, but this, you know, these three things definitely inspired like my foray into calm tech, like trying to take some information and put it into a different sense with this one, trying to use uh, labor in one sense and make it fun for somebody else and stop putting voice activation into everything, it's dumb. All right, so we have some information junk food. I think right now one of the, one of the issues is that we kind of have a fractal production of value. There's, there's value and then there's an interface with more value and then there's kind of, a, uh, kind of a value crisis where everything seems to have value at the same time. And that gives us the kind of intermittent reinforce, reinforcement that we have as like Skinnerian rats where we're just clicking the button to find the food. I've started to change this. I, keep my phone in airplane mode, I decide a couple times a day that I want to check something. And then maybe once a week I'll answer a lot of the stuff. Um, but I'll keep it, I'll be like, do I need to do that right now? No, I need to not worry about it. It's been a really hard process because this stuff gets your anxiety up. I want more of the Kairos time, I want more of the self-reflection time, even if it's dangerous, even if I'm bored, even if I hate myself, even if I'm scared of what I'm thinking about. I would rather have that and be alive than just fill my time endlessly with notifications from a machine. I call this poorly, and neuroscientists hate it, mental defragmentation. Because when I was a kid, I used to watch the mental def I used to watch the defragmentation on a computer, and you could just see the memory of the computer go, and that was really cool. Um, and I thought of what if you go on a road trip? Like I've gone on a road trip with some people in this room, and it's been really nice 
to just sit there and have uncompressed time and write note poetry and publish a little zine or, you know, just to have that human time. Um, because if you don't have that, are you being really reflective? Do you know who you are? Are you just repeating the same thing for 10 years? And I would ask all of you, what is it you want to do with your life? How do you want to live? Are you actually happy? Is any part of your day something that you enjoy living with? And if it's not, try putting your phone under a cast iron pan for an hour and seeing how you deal with your life or digital downtime. Um, yeah. That's a good quote, everything in moderation, especially moderation. There's an old talk from 10 years ago. Thanks so much for listening. The end. So do people have questions? Was that reasonable? It was really weird giving that talk. Uh, we can talk about anything for um, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then maybe we can wrap up. Does that sound good? Or we could continue longer. We're supposed to go to like six, but Arthur? Do we want a microphone for the live stream? Okay, hold on. Wait, wait. <clears throat> In the last 10 years, uh, are, have you encountered examples that you would add to that presentation? Like there's some neat things that you, that you ha have come about in, in the meantime? Yeah, I wrote a book on the calm tech part and the self-reflection part. Um, I wrote a book on the sound part, which will come out like next month. Um, I did a startup on one of the parts. Yeah, I did a, like all, this is like broken out into like a talk on VR, a talk on air, like yeah, there's there's been a lot that I would add that that's all kind of matured more or less, yeah. Um, but there's there's a lot here. I mean, the problem with this talk is that there's no real point. <laughs> and um, that was always like, how do I piece it out and then figure out which thing is appropriate for which era, right? Like, when I first gave the talk on alerts and how annoying they were in 2014 in Norway, nobody cared. It was rated a two out of five on the presentation level. Like, people didn't like this talk and they were really mad. They're like, why aren't you talking to us about cyborgs? We hired you to give a talk on cyborgs and you're talking to us about alerts. And I said, well, I have to practice this talk. And in a couple years, everybody will be annoyed with alerts and they'll wonder about how to have our attention back. And I have to start giving it now because it's not gonna be very good for like a year or two and I'm sorry. And so, you know, eventually people were like, yeah, we really care about alerts. But if I had tried to give a talk on alerts in 2010, like not even that, not even enough people had alerts in phones. Okay, yeah. But they were kind of like, there was a recession going on. Like people were worried about more stuff than alerts. So then what was that? Like, well, maybe that was a good time to do a startup on reconnecting people to like civic geo things, which went from an open source project to something bought by a large corporation. <laughs> so yeah, so that one was strange. Um, and then, yeah, the other one was, yeah, I, I, I guess it's, it's been broken up. And then like VR came back. Like part of this talk, which I didn't give, was about Steve Mann and all his VR and AR projects, which I just studied for historical purposes. And then like VR and AR came out and I could like break out this deck and suddenly people wanted me to speak at these virtual reality conferences. So I think my timeline is always like, I'm usually three years ahead. And so as long as I just care about it instead of just knock myself in the head and be like, well, nobody cares about it, therefore I shouldn't care about it. And I say, okay, nobody cares about it. Maybe I should really care about it and work on it. So I've just learned to trust my gut. Like, if I really care about a thing, I'll quietly do it, not tell anybody about it. Because people will say, oh, you have too much free time on your hands, or that's dumb, or don't talk about that. So I just quietly do something in the background, wait for it to be reasonable to release it, and then quietly release it, <coughs> have people hate it for a couple months or a year, and deliberately give it in front of people that hate it until it holds up on its own, which is not fun to do. It's like a musician like releasing some really bad music and they have to deal with it and they have to go on tour with it for like a year. But thankfully people have liked this stuff over time, so. There was a recent report that the exec Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Recent report that the exec, there's the digital divide has flipped and the executives in Silicon Valley are keeping screens away from their kids 
and people with the least resources are using screens as babysitters. Is this fundamentally changing our humanity growing up with screens instead of human interaction? And any comment you want to make on that? Yes, and then I'll get your question. Um, yeah, so all the executives I know in Silicon Valley send their kids to Waldorf Steiner schools. They do not, you know, they have, a lot of them have nannies, and if they don't, they try to spend their free time with kids. It's hard for people, to, like one person, to stay home with a kid anymore. Like, um, uh, my mom's job got automated, so she had to stay home with me. So I got I got lucky, but it definitely impoverished my family. It was not great. So I got like a lot of cool attention and training from my parents, which was nice. Um, and I didn't really have a lot of screen time. Um, I guess the screen time issue is that if the TV is that close to your face and the LED screen has specific frequencies of high energy blue light, it leads to corneal de degeneration before the age of 14. So corneal acres can detach and it leads to uh, needing surgery later in life. Uh, also like the depth of understanding reality, like you're not getting the depth perception and training that you would of like climbing outside in a tree. Like there's massive things. Also like delayed gratification. If you're used to pressing on a button and getting everything and you think your kid is really smart because they learned how to turn a page on the iPad and that's really smart instead of considering it's 40 years of industrial development and design that has gone into it, then you, you end up in a situation where like it's not really parents' fault. Like the parents who can't stay with their kids and occupy them in some other way or give them a notebook to write in, like they have to do something with their kids. You know, so I don't fault anybody for that. But for the people who have resources, yeah, they make sure that, I, I think like before the age of seven, kids should have physical and social and mental development, learn to work in teams, learn to do a long-term project over the course of six months so that they understand how long it takes. And then in schools, make sure that there's art and, and culture and all of the other stuff that takes a long time to train so that there's something other than tech. Because if you only get tech, it can lead to depression and anxiety and feelings of worthlessness because you're just comparing yourself to the highlight reel of everything that's been produced online and you don't see, as I was talking on the Future Prairie podcast, any of the middle stuff. You don't see any of the development. You don't see what it takes to make something. Um, so if you don't see any of that, then you know, you're, you're kind of getting cheated out of what it takes to do something and a kind of enriched childhood, which we can't blame anybody for, but that is a danger. And in terms of like dividing people, yeah. <laughs> like you're, you're looking at a generation who either is really depressed and commits suicide or gets opiate addiction uh, or a whole other group of people that learns to create and creates the next generation for people. So hopefully they'll create a really good generation for us in the future or they might not, but there's, hopefully there's more people around to do that. That's really bleak. Uh, please ask the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, is this kind of uh, similar to what the, his question? Um, I loved all of that. Um, I, um, working with uh, kids with disabilities um, uh, is what I've, I've been doing with, um, and specifically with kids with behavior disabilities. People, uh, just kids that just don't know how to treat each other. Um, they, you know, a lot of them are very violent and explosive. Almost every single one of them that I've worked with in four years um, has a technology addiction, actually. And it's a very common, very, very common thing. Um, and I actually just had a, a conversation with a coworker about how um, our, our jobs, with, our, we're teaching these kids how to regulate emotion, how to, te how to teach people, pe teaching people how to treat one another. It, it, it could potentially be the, the oldest job you know, that's around. So I was just gonna see what, what you might have to say about that. Yeah. Um, I think I'm on the hook to write another book after this one. And the only thing I can think of to start with is, you know, you have that, the, the, the rat and the cocaine lever thing where the rat presses the cocaine button until they die. Yeah, the Skinnerian rat, right? Like, there's different versions of this test. There was a study done later for these rats. And what they noticed is that they had another controlled test, rats with enriched environments and rats with unenriched environments. You just throw a rat in a cage with nothing else to do and they're gonna press the lever forever. But the rats with families and activities and free time and cool stuff ignored the lever. So I think instead of saying like, it's a technology addiction, we could say, what is unenriched in somebody's life and how do you bring back that meaning and Kairos time and culture? 
And if you can bring that back, you're going to see a level off in that addiction. That's what I'm hoping the hypothesis from the rats applied broadly to humans non-scientifically might do. All right? <laughs> caveat, caveat, caveat. But I think it's important to look at that and say, you know, how do you enrich somebody's life and how can we do that without a lot of money? Well, actually, the cool thing about culture is that it grows between spaces. It grows in periods of political weirdness, you know, and if we can embrace that, then we're going to have a chance, I think. Hopefully it's a more hopeful uh, thing than the last answer to the question. I'm trying to be more positive. I would agree with that. It just, it takes, it's hard to teach self-care to somebody who hasn't grown up with it and who has parents who haven't taught them that. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. I, uh, in thinking through your metaphor of the sarcophagus room uh, <laughs> uh, and, and where uh, information lies, yeah. uh, I, when I think of um, the Stanford group, uh, the Captology group yeah. that BJ Fogg has put together uh, over the years and the sort of the birth of Instagram, I, I wonder if you could address a way in which what I think you're pointing at, which is how do we encourage kids or students, et cetera, to emerge out of their sarcophagus rooms into the <laughs> light of day, into the outside world? What captology is there for the living world? Thanks, Jer. Uh, Jer also runs a conference, What is Media, What is Life, with the University of Oregon. I would suggest checking that out every year. Um, that's how I met the... Uh, ex-church group, VR, spa, and a lot of things. So thank you for being here. Um, well, I don't know if I have any of the answers, but I would say like, yeah, this the next generation of children, they're getting their driver's licenses later. They're not socializing in the same way. Um, they're socializing through, not with. Like through a device, through a mediator, not with each other. And that's just a, you know, it's a, it's a change. Um, I'm right on the cusp of the two generations. <laughs> so, you know, I got my driver's license at 18. Like, I, you know, I got everything late. Um, and I would say I was highly depressed because I didn't know that there was anything else in the world. Like, I was stuck in just tech. And until a strange individual introduced me to the idea of other stuff, like, I couldn't really get out of that. So, you know, if you eradicate arts and music and other cultural programs in schools and you just give people tech and you think adding more tech and iPads are the answer, you're robbing people of a potential future that they could have had because they didn't even know it existed. So how do you do that without any more arts funding because that's hard to find, right? How do you do that when it's very, it's good for the economy to have people that are depressed because they'll pay more for stuff and they'll sell their stuff for less and they'll be online like a run on sentence, right? At some point that will invert and it won't be good for the economy anymore. And hopefully that day will come soon because it's really getting annoying. Um, but in terms of like introducing people to that, like all I could do in school is join clubs. <laughs> and joining clubs because they can be run on a very small budget. You know, you can get secondhand instruments, you can get weird clay supplies, you can do a Saturday science class if one of those random great teachers stays after school and doesn't grade papers that night and doesn't spend time with their family that night because they're running your Wednesday science after school class. That, you know, that's one way. Uh, another way is like, how do you do that as a kid when you can't run down the street and go see a show? <laughs> like, how can you do that when all the culture you see is compressed into MPEG-4 on YouTube and you're in a tiny thing? So hopefully there'll be something more, maybe Legos, non-branded Legos, maybe a piece of paper and a pad, maybe like uninterrupted quiet time, you know, an hour a day where you have to be self-reflective. Maybe allowing people to be on a computer one or two hours a day. Like I did a survey of like a thousand people, how did you learn to program? And a lot of people said, well, I didn't have access to the family computer except for once a week. So I got these computer programming books and I like wrote it out and then I and then I typed it into the computer when I got it and then it screwed up and then there was a bug and then I thought about the bug for a whole week and then when I went back to the computer I fixed it but then it did something weirder and then I had an idea of what happened and I became a really good programmer. 
It was because they weren't allowed to be on it as much. And that's kind of the same as like, if you can take a picture of anything, does a picture mean anything? But if you have like three pictures you can take, what are they going to be of, right? So I think it's just kind of the idea of like, if there's an escalator in front of a gym, people will take it. Like if we artificially <laughs> like limit some of these things, suddenly they become more valuable and we get more of the delayed gratification back and we make use of the weird stuff in our environment instead of just clicking a button and getting a reward. I'm hoping that might be steps toward an answer. Matt, you had a question? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Amber, another great talk and a really nice dialogue going. So I just wanted to pick up the thread from what we were talking about a few minutes back. Um, I was wondering if you've connected with people like Tristan Harris or any of these Silicon Valley heretics who started time well spent or humane tech dot org and, and whether or not you see that initiative like really taking hold within the culture in Silicon Valley and wherever else just in the tech circles that you run in. Yeah. Where's this all headed? Yeah, I hung out with Tristan for a whole day in New York, had dinner with him on another occasion, talked to him a bunch. So for those of you who don't know, Tristan Harris is an ex-Googler. And the great thing about being an ex-Googler is you can say, oh, I'm an ex-Googler. It's like saying I'm an ex-Christian or I'm an ex-whatever, ex-anything. A complete swap, right? And because Google is so much in the news and he's a fairly attractive person, it's easy to take a big photo and put him on the front page of the Atlantic. And the real big thing that got him was his friend or somebody who didn't even know him made some poetry about it, walked down the streets of New York and put that as a, as a video that became viral about time well spent. So it was really interesting to look at that. And, and when I met Tristan a couple times, he was overwhelmed because everybody wanted him to speak at a conference. They wanted him to write a book and he was raising funding and getting a whole group of people around him just to take in the intensity. So it wasn't that he was trying to do this or he's smug about it. He's just a human that's overwhelmed by the thing that he was trying to not be overwhelmed by. So what I like about his effort is that on the Time Well Spent website, there is a series of Chrome plugins and other tools to get your time back from tech. And I would encourage everybody to look at that. It's really good. But in terms of like a long-term solution, you know, there are plenty of ex-Googlers and ex-Facebook people that say, let's get our time back. But I, I don't like to think in terms of a year. Like I like to think in terms of 10 years. Like what will exist in 10 years? How will, all will our time be spent? You know, like oil painting and watercolor and music will be around, right? But like maybe not the current social media interface that we have. So I prefer to spend my time on those things that are unmasterable, right? Which take a really enormous time to do something with and that you can quietly do by yourself that like give you more meaning. And I think there's, right now, it's just an exciting trend to say tech is bad and uh, let's have some time back and yeah, you know. I think with the calm tech effort that I've been trying to do is I've dredged up some stuff in the 80s and 90s in Xerox Park that I believe to be more human universals about attention. And what I'm trying to do is take those to the top of companies and say, hey, you don't need to be afraid of people hating tech and you don't need to be afraid of tech but you need to be more deliberate about how you integrate it into your company because it costs you more if you integrate it badly. And that's it. So it's a simple message that I think should be able to not, ex not be too exotic and not be too exciting or spicy, but just like slowly feel the cracks between these spaces as a very slow glacier type movement. I prefer to do that than think about a thing at a year at a time. Because initially I was like, ah, <laughs> you know, this is intense. Uh, but then I was like, wow, you're overwhelmed. Oh my gosh. Like, well, I'll, I'll just focus on this. And you can focus on that. And great. I'll just amplify your Chrome plugins and send me messages every once in a while, you know. So it's peaceable. Yeah. So good question. I hope it's an adequate answer. Are there? Just building on that, um, Tristan was interviewed in a Wired podcast with uh, Noah Yuval Harari, and um, the the author of Sapiens and Homo Deus um, recently came out with his 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Yeah, and I'm wondering how you might address that um, concern he has of technological disruption and um, what you see, 
you know, as the uh, challenges going forward. Yeah, what is it, 21 rules for the 21st century? It's actually a really good piece, I would suggest. Like, he, he's writing some pretty good stuff. What, what is his name again, the author of Sapiens? Right, Yuval Noah Harari. So, a, a fantastic writer, but um, what was I going to say? How was I going to address? What, wait, what was the last question? <laughs> oh, oh, thank you, thank you. So, if you go back in time to agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, there was always this terror that, like, you know, you had kids chained to machines in Manchester in the UK. Like, that was terrible. Like, now you have kids chained to machines, but their iPods, and it's the internet, it's playground of factory, and they're paying, you know, tithing to the, to the sheep god and, you know, playing ads. You know. How is that different? Well, it's different because the kids last longer, right? They are not dying of, like, cotton lung, right? But they're still indentured servants, right? So, like, this is thing, like, we're in another generation of that, and it's really that whole spectrum, like, it's not everything is horrible and everything is great. For some people, things are okay. For some people, things aren't really good. And we just have to say, we're at a teenage point in this where we're basically at, you know, 13-year-old forum thread disaster, um, but all of us are taking it seriously instead of just shoving it off. And I think that's one of, like, the great disappointments of the last five years is that, like, trolls we've emotionally reacted to instead of saying, okay, this is a forum thread gone wrong. Okay, next forum. Oh no, the whole world is in the same forum thread and it's gone really horribly wrong. You know, but we used to have, and I think that's the issue of scale. Right now, I'm less afraid of, I'm more afraid of this, this scale issue. You used to have forums and you had small communities on forums and if somebody was going to commit suicide or they were crazy or whatever, you would have 100 people in that forum or it would be a motorcycle enthusiast forum is about specific interests. And you could say, oh, well, I think I know that person's phone number, call or go over to their house or, or figure out something. But how can you do that with a centralized system of content moderators who are paid nine to five and chain smoke on their breaks? Because I went and interviewed a bunch of them. Um, because they have to moderate horrible content. They're not completely attached to anything. Does empathy scale, you know? And you have to ask these questions of like, what works at scale and what doesn't work at scale? And I think if we go back to the Greek city-states model, the Greek city-states worked pretty well because you had small states and people could switch leadership around and you didn't have too many more people. Now, this is, you know, this is just my 10-year-old self saying, I read Plato and I'm cool, you know, and I like the idea of city-states. It's completely wrong. But that model was small enough and distributed enough that people had ownership when things went wrong. Like if we could fix our own potholes in the city or we could plant our own trees or we could decide our own city design, that could be interesting. If we could decide to live in a walkable community and not have these giant cars everywhere, if we could have Barcelona city blocks, right? But instead, things are defined for us by like some larger structure, the template itself online or MySpace or whatever user experience decides to change. And I think that is one of the fears that I have about technology is that I want to go down the street and have the television repair person repair my TV. I want to know them. I want to live in that community maybe for a while and grow roots there and develop something slowly over time. I want older people to have respect and look good and stay smart. I want people to be well dressed in quality clothes that are not able to be made at scale. Like I would kind of want something that's a little bit more real than this kind of like point and shoot, trash it quickly society. And that's really hard to have. And so that's kind of like my reflection on the 21 rules for something something that he wrote, which was good, <laughs> you know, is that we're going through growing pains right now. Hopefully we'll settle in, but this era right now is temporary, just like every other era is. Think longer term, you deserve it. Don't get so caught up right now because in 10 years, things can change in 15 years. We were just getting phones with cameras. Things can really, really change in the next five years, and we actually have the ability to help change that. So, you know, <laughs> I feel like I'm like preaching or something. Like, don't go home and think on the couch and watch the next rerun of Netflix. There's no reruns on Netflix, it's all rerun. Um, you know, but like, do something, you know, right? Like, Remember how you used to maybe write in a journal or like paint something for yourself and you didn't have to send it to the web? Like if you actually sit down and wrote for 30 minutes tonight and didn't publish it, what would that mean? What would that look like?
Like, we don't have to make stuff for other people. We can make it for ourselves. And I think if we get a little bit of that back, the hard time, and have each day have something slightly unique in it, cool things could happen. You will surprise yourself. Like, the single biggest thing that I... This is so silly, inspirational quote, but it was like Bill Gates was like, people underestimate what you do, what you can do in five years, but overestimate what you can do in one. So as long as you just sufficiently set the timeline, you can do whatever you want because things change a lot. So glacier time, not river time. Rivers are like super exciting. I don't want to be super exciting. I want to be boring, but I want to be doing something that makes somebody remember something. Yeah. The end. <laughs> Okay, that's Cyber Camp. Thanks for coming. Uh, Dave Moser on the second floor says, please send people up to be scanned. Better lighting today. <laughs> uh, he's on the second floor. You have about a half an hour before he is going to tear down, or maybe even longer, but we need to make sure, not any, how much time do we really have to be polite to you and other organizers? Okay. Okay, sounds good. Uh, yeah, so second floor up, Dave Moser can do a 3D scan and send it to you. Um, thanks for coming. See you in two years. Oh, wait. I would like to thank the live streaming crew. I would like to thank all the volunteers. I, uh, I'm really bad at this part. Thank you, everyone, for making it possible. Uh, drink all the beer and whatever else is out there. <laughs>